As an African-American woman who began transitioning in the 1960s, Tracy Jada O'Brien is a rarity. Few lived publicly then, and fewer survived. She grew up in St. Louis. My childhood was fantastic. The only thing that was lacking was the affirming of my gender, because I felt different from the very beginning of my life. Trans wasn't a word yet. She just felt female. When she would act on it, adults would reprimand her. Kids would bully her. But she says her higher power always gave her these glimmers of affirmation. At the carnival, there was a traveling carnival called the Royal American Carnival. And they had these sideshows. At these sideshows, they had these, what they used to call shake dancers. Like they'd be cl uh, cl scantily clad women or uh, impersonators doing shake dances. And there was, there was this one impersonator, no, no there's one person. It wasn't, it was, she wasn't really an impersonator, but it, once again, it was, that, it was that connection. Her name was Greta Garland. I mean, I'll never get her name, and I saw me. As a teen, she found a library book on Christine Jorgensen, one of the first people to successfully undergo gender affirmation surgery. Don't ask me how I found it. I found it, and I stole it. And I brought it home, <laughs> and I brought it home and put it under my bed. So I knew, oh my God, there's an answer for that. And she shot up to six foot three. You know, I didn't look like the average chick that walked down the street, you know, and when I walked down the street, people laughed at me. You know, and, and, and that happened all my life, you know? And as you see, it's a hurt to this day. At 19, she moved somewhere that felt freer. San Francisco was like a utopia. It was the early 70s, it was the hippie era, it was the free love era, and it was just so much fun. It was so, so much fun. Fun, but tough. She lived unhoused in the Tenderloin District and became addicted to drugs. What I found there was a place to survive. And what I found there were um, people like me that were trying to survive. What I found there was prostitution. What I found was hustlers. What I found was a stage. What I found was a bar. And that's what I was shown. So that's what we did. Few businesses would hire openly trans women then. Sex work was a common way to survive. I came to San Diego in the early 80s because there were sailors down here that would give us money for sex. You know, so we said, let's go to San Diego. She was 31, still unhoused and addicted. She says her trauma immobilized her. In order to survive, you know, we would go in the stores and steal because at some point in time, my looks was not enough to even make $2 because I, I was so deeply in my drug addiction. She says after a dozen petty theft tickets and prostitution charges, she found herself in San Diego jail, Section 2D. That's the Queen's tank. That's where the transgender girls and the effeminate gay boys are housed. A woman there told her about an LGBT recovery center. O'Brien decided to go after her release. And that was the best decision I'd ever made in my life. I was the longest resident to ever be there. And I needed that time. She started interviewing for caregiving jobs. I had found a tall girl shop and a big foot girl store. So I, I was able to you know, put myself together with the way I looked presentable. And so I was afraid, but I went, you know. It was still a dead end. And they sent me letters that say, in no specific terms, we would ever entertain the thought of licensing you to take care of people with, with your kind of background. I was devastated. I was devastated. So O'Brien found a place that would employ her, an HIV AIDS care home. And some of the girls that I was in jail with came there, and I was with them when they passed away. She leaned on her community and bent her arc in a new direction. She says she attended City College, became an alcohol and drug counselor. She modeled for a flyer she developed with an AIDS foundation to reach sex workers, consulted for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to improve policies for trans people, and became a caseworker for family health services. What has kept you going for so long without burning out? I have burned out. I did. It's really weird at home. I, I keyed around like an old lady, but it's when I leave the house to get, get to work, I'm up and at it, I'm up and at it. I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission, you know. I'm on a mission. I don't want any other trans or non-binary or anyone who's slightly different to ever feel or go through what I went through. This month, she'll attend the Democratic National Convention. What do you think your child self would think if they could see you now? Oh, she'd be ecstatic. She'd say, oh, mommy, you did it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Katie Heisen, KPBS News.